Well, good morning, GBC Online. It's great to have you with us wherever you are. I'm Mark Rader, senior pastor at GBC, and with me is Matt Willis. Hello, welcome. Uh, how you doing, Matt? I'm good. I'm good. It's been a it's been a good week. Mm-hmm. Uh, last Sunday, we had the pleasure of baptizing five of our youth and young adults. I'm still on a bit of a buzz after mm-hmm. that. Our mm-hmm. church was full with friends and family. Yep. It was just such a beautiful. Um, celebration of what Jesus does in people's lives. So yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm buzzing. I'm still living yeah. off it, yeah, living off right. the high. It was really good. On Monday night, we actually had a, a staff meal as well. We did. Um, for, you know, for those of you who've kind of been playing along at home, you know we've been adding a fair number of staff and a fair number of staff had kind of moved on. And so it's kind of the first time for us to all get together. So we kind of had... Sunday night, which was great, and yep. then Monday night an opportunity. Uh, ironically, on the long weekend, when I thought there'd be no chance we'd get everyone <laughs> together, uh, we somehow managed to get all the staff. Well, because no one set. had work, <laughs> so we were all free, and the food was delicious. It was so great. It was so, a good time. It's a good week, uh, and looking forward to what God will continue to do. You're preaching in our final installment of Following Jesus in John's Gospel. We're wrapping it up today. Right. Do you have a bit of a, like a 10-second kind of teaser for us? Well, we come to the end of, I guess, Jesus's teaching ministry. So we're at the crescendo of it all as he kind of gives us that last piece of the puzzle around what we need to know to follow him. All right. Looking forward to that Uh, and trust that you are as well. But would you allow me to pray for us as we open our hearts to hear from God today? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can join together through the medium of digital technology. And regardless of where we are right now, uh, in our living rooms, uh, kitchens, back verandas, bedrooms, in the car, uh, wherever we might find ourselves, uh, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would unite us together and that you'd be opening our hearts to hear from you this morning. We pray that the things that uh, we engage with today would not just be encouraging, but would continue to change our lives as we seek to follow Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I see many searching for Speak and peace, so unexpected. 
branch for you. Oh, hi, Glenn. Thank you. Oh, look at this. It looks so green and fresh. That's great. Yes, it was on the tree. It wasn't doing anything. It was getting in the way of cars. So oh. I had to cut it off. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, well, it's a shame to waste it. I mean, I think I've got a good spot in my yard. I might, I might go pop it in my garden and, and, and have it grow into a tree. Oh, Beck, it doesn't go, work that way. In, you dig a hole and put it in the ground. In a couple of days, the leaves are going to go brown. It's going to die. Oh. It's only good for firewood. Oh, but it, it, it looks like a tree. Oh, but it's not. It's not connected to the trunk. It has no roots. You put it in the ground. The water can't get sucked up into the branches. Yeah. Uh, it, on a windy day or a big bird lands in it, it'll fall over. Oh, um, you know, I'm no gardener at all, Glenn, but this is sounding kind of familiar from somewhere. Oh, yes. In the Bible, there's a passage in John chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. Oh, okay. I've got, I've got my Bible. Let's have a look. Um, John 15, 5 and 6. Yeah, here it is. Okay. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you stay joined to me and I stay joined to you, then you will produce lots of fruit but you cannot do anything without me. If you don't stay joined to me, you will be thrown away. You will be like dry branches that are gathered up and burned in a fire. See this branch, it's been cut from the tree. It's no longer connected. So it's gonna die. It's only good for being on a fire. Okay. It's 
And it's like us, we need to be connected to Jesus. If we're connected to Jesus, we produce good fruit and do good quality work for God. Okay, so by connected to Jesus, you mean like reading our Bible and praying and and like spending time with our church family and friends? Exactly, and acknowledging him and praising him every day and in everything that we do. Ah, and sharing him with everyone that we meet. That's right. Okay. Well, this branch is no good now. All right. Maybe we can have a fire and toast marshmallows. That sounds like a good plan. Right. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, good morning again. It's good to have you with us, GBC Online, wherever you might find yourself. Trust that you've already been encouraged as we've gathered together in worship. A couple things to let you know about that are taking place or have taken place in the life of the church. Uh, last week, we announced our May Mission Month total. It's actually grown a little bit, so it's just a little bit over $246,000 at this point in time. We're still kind of counting all the last bits and pieces that have come in. I was really delighted to know that we had almost as many donors as we had last year. So I think last year there were 182, and this year there were 180, uh, which is absolutely outstanding. It's one of the marks of a successful May Mission Month. Uh, and uh, just want to thank you again for your generosity. But last Sunday, we also had our Hope Drive, an opportunity for us to bring non-perishable goods uh, to provide for Hope Field, which is the counseling and, and uh, social um, organization that meets out of our church uh, and to help those in need. And uh, we gathered like, I don't know, I, I counted about 50 or 60 bags worth of food, uh, as well as a handful of people who managed to drive things through through the drop off. We're going to be doing that again the second Sunday of every month. Uh, if you are local and are able to drive through or bring those things to uh, the services themselves, I'd love for you to be a part of that. And as Matt mentioned at the very outset of our service today, uh, we had five baptisms last Sunday evening, and it was just a remarkable opportunity for us to reflect uh, on what God has done, particularly in the lives of five young people. Uh, their families and friends were there to support them. It was just an amazing opportunity to celebrate. Uh, and, and I was really struck by the, um, the willingness of these young people to share uh, some of the hard things that they've gone through in their lives and the difference that Jesus has made in them. So really super encouraged by that. A couple of other things to let you know in terms of ways that you can be involved. First of all, we have our mid-year meeting on Sunday, the 4th of July. It's an opportunity essentially for us to report on where we're up to, kind of at the halfway mark in the year. We generally don't make any kind of major decisions in terms of voting, uh, but we'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, you can jump onto the E! News or onto GBC Links, uh, and you can access the paperwork in terms of the minutes from our last meeting and the agenda. The reports will be up uh, probably next week. It'll run from 12.30 till no later than 2. Uh, there'll be a live version, obviously, but there'll also be an opportunity to join via Zoom, and we'll be making that link available on the, on the Sunday itself. So we'd love for you to be a part of that um, conversation, to hear a little bit more about what's going on in the life of the church. And something quite specific for GBC Online, uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, we had a little meeting. I had a meeting with some of you uh, after one of our services. We chatted a bit about the future of the online space, uh, where I shared a little bit of my vision for what this might look like. Uh, and uh, the opportunity for us to increase engagement so that there's a genuine sense of community. I took a bunch of the ideas that uh, we had talked about and some of the insights that I gained from that, and we've been kind of working away at it. And I just want to let you know that the start of term three, so July 18th, is kind of the start of what we want to be trying. Uh, so at that point, we're hoping to trial a period of Zoom meetings right after our uh, service together, an opportunity to kind of catch up. They'll be relatively brief, you know, 20 to 30 minutes maybe, grab a cuppa, uh, and we'll just have an opportunity to share and get to know each other a little bit. We'll see how that goes, see if that's the right sort of thing for us to do. We're also uh, just working through finding some leaders to run a digital life group. So if you are interested in being part of a digital life group, we'd love for you to let us know, uh, because that will determine the number of leaders that we need to be involved in that. And if you are interested in potentially being a leader of a digital life group, please let us know in the chat as well or email Matt uh, here at the church. Love for you to be involved in that way. So we're starting the process uh, towards July 18th. Just kind of mark that off. That's when we'll start piloting some of those things. Really looking forward to continue to develop this community into a genuine community of faith that knows each other and is engaged with each other a little bit as well.
So let me take an opportunity right now, though, to pray for us as a community of faith before we hear the word and Matt shares his message with us. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ways in which you have blessed us. We thank you in particular for the ways in which we have been able to share some of what you've given us with those around us. I thank you for the continuing support and the growing support for Hopefield uh, in the increased number of non-perishable items that come in every second Sunday of the month. And I just thank you for the outpouring of generosity. Thank you again for uh, the outpouring of generosity towards May Mission Month and the opportunity to see lives changed by Jesus uh, around the world. I pray that you would multiply uh, the, uh, the donations that have been made, that their impact might be greater than we could have hoped for because of the involvement of your spirit. We want to pray for our community of faith as a whole and continue to pray that you would um, be changing lives. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate with those five young people last week uh, who were baptized, who took that significant step of faith and pray that there would be more stories that we would hear around us. We pray that as we uh, gather on the 4th of July to reflect on where you have brought us so far and what we believe the future holds, that you would continue to guide us and lead us in that space. And that as we consider uh, in this medium, in this congregation, about what it looks like to be an online community, I pray that you would lead and guide us in that space too that this would be more than just something that we uh, participate with individually, but something that we can do together, knit us together, stitch us together, uh, bring us together in unity that we might participate with you in your grand plans to restore and renew the world through Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, just before Matt comes to share, let me read for you from John chapter 15, uh, the first 17 verses. I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will become even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in, in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Well, I don't know about you, but I am a huge lover of a good story. I'll take it any way it comes. Book, movie, TV series, you name it, I'll eat it up. And there are so many aspects that make a story great. The character development, the plot progression, the emotional investment that you put into a love story. I love a good love story. But the best part of any story for me is that lead up to the end, that crescendo of, of plot and character and everything that it holds. The part of the story where all the characters, all the plot lines and all the different elements start to come together are interwoven in this crescendo and climax that just has you on the edge of your seat. 
that final last ditched effort to save the world, to beat the villain, to declare one's love. It's the best part of the story. And today, as we wrap up our series, looking at the invitation to follow Jesus in John's gospel, we find ourselves at the lead up to the end, at the close of Jesus's earthly ministry. Here in chapter 15, on the night before his death, we have Jesus making his final declaration about who he is to his disciples. I am the true vine. It is his seventh and final I am statement. And seven in the scriptures is a number that means the conclusion of things, the completion of things. There were seven days of creation, seven miracles that identified Jesus as the Christ. And now here we find the seventh I am statement. It is the final piece of the puzzle as Jesus begins to pull everything together, leading up to the end, everything that he has done and everything that he has taught in order that his disciples can fully understand who Jesus is and what he has come to do. It is the way in which Jesus has chosen to close his farewell discourse in John's gospel. In a sense, it is his final words of teaching to his disciples. I am the true vine. But what's incredible about what Jesus says in this final I am statement is although Jesus is making a huge declaration about who he is and what he has come to do and how that impacts our faith in him, he is also taking note of the other players in the plot, of the other pieces on the board, and he's shedding light on who they are and the role that they play in this overall story. And so it seems only right that we go on this journey with Jesus, looking at the big picture to understand not only who he is, but who he is in the Father and who we are in him and how that shapes our own story as we seek to follow Jesus. Because it is in this interweaving, entangling relationship between God the Father the son that he sent and the people he saves that shows us who we are called to follow and how we are called to follow. And so to start us off with the first role, the first character in this story, in this metaphor and allegory that Jesus gives for us here in chapter 15, I want to look at God, the father, the gardener, as Jesus describes him. And the Greek word used to describe God as the gardener also means cultivator. It means to improve and prepare, to encourage and promote, to nurture and to tend to. And there's a very parental tone to the work that God is doing and the manner in which he is doing it. Because at first glance, the role of the gardener can seem harsh, can't it? Almost judgmental, brutal even, with the complete severing of the fruitless branches. But it isn't about judgment, but rather a reflection of God's own care and ownership of the vineyard, which he demonstrates through the cutting out of dead wood and the pruning of lively branches because both are essential to the health and productivity of the vineyard. Both are essential to the health and the productivity of a faith community and of us, the individual disciples. And God's will is to see growth. It's to see a fruitful life, to cultivate that. And that requires discipline. The pruning reflects God's concern and well-being for the individual believer where the purging shows God's concern for the body as a whole. And it got me thinking. It got me thinking about my own role as a parent, in particular in regards to my elder son, Harper. Now, when I look at this blue-eyed, beautiful boy, I see a little me. 
and it brings me great joy. But it also scares me because I see some of my own flaws in him as well. And some of those attributes caused a lot of problems for me growing up. So as his parent, I try and shape those behaviors so that he can grow up to be the best version of himself. I don't do it because these behaviors annoy me, although some of them do. I don't do it because these behaviors are wrong, although some of them are. I do it because I want my son to grow and thrive. And that is the heart of the father as he tends to the branches of the vine, as he cultivates us, a desire to see us grow and thrive. And this means we need to be willing to be pruned. It means we need to be willing to be cleansed. We need to open ourselves up to those sometimes harsh, but always valuable and transformational refinements that God is doing in each of our lives. We need to consider what needs to be pruned in our life. What is sapping up our time, our resources and our energy and taking away from the work of God in our life and in the world around us? And sometimes that process can hurt and we can wonder if God even knows what he is doing because sometimes it requires having an honest conversation with ourselves or asking someone who knows us well to have an honest conversation with us, calling out the fruit that isn't of God in our lives. And sometimes it requires making those big changes, changes that can lead us into a new space, an uncomfortable space, an unknown space, but a space that has been prepared for growth. And sometimes it's simply making those small changes in our everyday, holding up the things that we spend our time on, those, those mundane activities and asking God whether to keep it or prune it. And it might seem like we are the only branch being pruned while other branches need it more. But I'm telling you now, everyone is getting a light trim. And note that the role of pruning rests with the gardener, not the branches. And we need to remember and trust that God knows what he is doing. And there is a reason that he has the role that he has and that we have ours. And it's because God wants to free us from the shoots that drain our life and energy, that drain our faith. And he does that by continually caring for us through our lives to keep us spiritually healthy and productive. And he does that through the gift of the vine. Jesus, the true vine. Now, there is a rich tradition of the vine as a symbol of Israel within the Old Testament. It is enshrined in the scriptures, in art and in liturgy. Israel was God's vineyard, the vine God brought out of Egypt and planted in a land that he himself had cleared, that he had prepared, that he had promised. And notice that throughout all time, God's role has not changed. He remains the gardener. He remains tending to the vineyard, but ours has. God's people, our role has changed. It's almost as if while God was working, you know, doing his thing, restoring and renewing all things, he realized to himself, I need a better vine. The Israelites had gone through this perpetuating cycle of being faithful, having doubt, rebelling, finding themselves in a tough situation and turning back from God and then going through it all over again. And it was a broken cycle. And God saw that and saw to himself that he needed a better vine. And here we have Jesus declaring that he is the true vine. And the word true is often used to describe what is eternal, what is heavenly, what is divine. And here we have given to us through Jesus, the divine vine. Where Israel was imperfect, Jesus is perfect. 
where Israel was the type, Jesus is the reality. And through Jesus, we tap into the source of life directly from God himself, because this vine is the essence of God. It is God himself become man. And we need to stay connected to that. That's the invitation. And we see that in verse seven. If you remain in me, Jesus says, and my words remain in you. That is how we stay connected to the vine, through his word, because there is power in the word of God. And to fully understand that, I think we need to turn back to the very beginning of John's gospel in his prologue as he opens this scripture for us in the first five verses. If you have your Bible with you, flick back to chapter one, verse one where it reads, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus was with God in the beginning of all things. He is God and created all things. He's the source of life and light itself. And we tap into that through the word and through obedience to his word, allowing it to not only give us life, but transform our lives. That's not the only way in which we stay connected to the vine. Verse nine, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Through Jesus, we are connected to the love of God. And the love between Jesus and the father, it's not a past event. It's not something that has been, that the stories write about and that we reflect on. It is permanent. It is concrete. It is everlasting. It is eternal. It is the love that breathed life into the world at the beginning of all things. It is the love that saw God humble himself and become man. It is the love that faithfully went to the cross to die and three days later rose and conquered the grave. It is this love that Jesus invites us into calls us to stay connected to, says, I am the way in which you can experience this love. Stay connected the same way the branch stays connected to the vine. And so what does this mean for us to remain in his word and in his love? Well, again, we read it here in verse 14 to 15. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. To be connected to the vine means to have revelation of God, to know God and to know his plans. Just think about what that actually means to have that sense of intimacy, to be in the inner circle, to be connected and to be able to be directly connected with the source of God, with who God is and the knowing, to be able to know who he is and the plans that he has. Think about the power that that gives us to have that revelation. Think about the year that we just had. Uh, For us as a family, it was probably around April that I turned to my wife. We were homeschooling our seven-year-old. Sam was six months pregnant. We were juggling working from home and the strictest COVID restrictions we'd ever had. And I turned to her and I said, if only we knew. If only we knew the end to this. If only we knew how this was going to play out. If only we knew what was happening, it wouldn't be so bad. The not knowing was the hardest part. And yet here we have it. Through Jesus, we never have to wonder again. Through Jesus, we get to experience revelation and understanding. 
We get to experience the new that God is creating. We get to experience the restoration that comes from his work. Nothing will be hidden from us. We get to know his plans. We get to know without a shadow of a doubt who he is. And that knowing creates trust. It creates connection. We need only stay connected to the vine, the source of life, the source of God's love and his word, Jesus, in order to know God and know what he is doing and trust in those plans. And then there's us, the branches. And when Jesus says, you are the branches, he's speaking to each disciple, but he's also speaking in the plural. A vine doesn't only have one branch. He's speaking to all of his disciples, past, present and future, the body that we create, the church that we represent. The invitation is both for the individual as well as the collective. And he has said that there's a promise here, a promise to be connected, a promise to to know the Father and to experience his love, to experience revelation. But there is also an expectation in what Jesus is saying, an expectation that if we are remaining in the vine, if we are remaining connected to Jesus, drawing from his word, drawing from his love, then there should be evidence of that. There should be fruit. And as we read this passage, I see that fruit taking two shapes. And the first is obedience, obedience to the word. If we are experiencing revelation of God through the word, then we need to be living that out in our lives. We need to participate, not just spectate. Um, It might surprise you to know that I'm not a massive sport buff. I know a rugged man like me who would have thought it. But the one thing that I find interesting about sport is how everyone's an expert. Everyone knows the game. Everyone has done the research. Everyone has an opinion on what the other team should have done, on what our players should have done, the coach should have done, the ref should have done. And they all feel very comfortable calling it out from the sideline from the comfort of their seat. They watch the game, they spectate the game, and then they leave. Being a fan is passive. Being a follower means getting involved. We cannot just take the revelation of God, the understanding of God, and then go, well, wasn't that a great game? See you next week. We need to participate. We need to come to God and say, throw me in coach. What can I do coach? What play are we doing today coach? We need to read the word and experience the word and then live it out. But also the fruit in our life takes shape in another way, in loving one another. And I love the way that Jesus talks about love here as a verb. In verse 13, he says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The example that Jesus gives to illustrate his love is an action, not simply a state of mind. And it's also sacrificial. It costs us something. It needs to be intentional. Now we all have our people and it's really easy to love them. Family and friends that we do life with, that we welcome into our home, that we catch up with regularly, who we have history with and have been in our lives for years and years. It's really easy to love them, to share the love of Christ with them. But what about actively loving those that we don't know yet? Or even actively loving those that we don't necessarily like? Well, at that point, we say we're too busy. We don't have the time. Our plate is full. Someone else will do it. But Jesus calls us to be a living embodiment of the love that he has for the Father, that he shares with us. And we need to be that love in the world to all. Love one another. 
Jesus, as an act of his love, laid down his life. Surely we can lay down our time, our resources, our desires, and even our own pride for the sake of those that he places in our life. Obedience to the word and love for one another. That is the fruit that we as the branches should be growing because love and obedience are linked together. You cannot have one without the other. Love manifested is obedience and obedience manifested is love. If you were truly seeking to obey the word, then the love of God will flow out of you in all that you do. And if you are truly seeking to share the love of God with others, then you will obey God's word and live it out in every opportunity because that's what it means to be fruitful. That's what it means to stay connected to the vine. That's what it means to allow God to prune us, to cultivate us. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. Well, thanks, Matt, for sharing that. Uh, I hope that you've been really encouraged uh, as we've looked at John's gospel and his somewhat unique take on what it means to follow Jesus, to reconsider your own discipleship. And it's, so, um, it's so refreshing to recall that while obedience and love um, are the natural outcomes, they're the natural outcomes of being connected to Jesus. Uh, we don't have to become obedient and love others in order to be connected to the vine. It works the other way around. Uh, that idea of the Father looking out for us, caring for us, that we might be fruitful, uh, that there might be benefit for the Father, for the kingdom, for others, is such a remarkable way to finish what I think has been a really encouraging series. Uh, trust that you take that message with you into this week, that it continues to resonate in your heart and mind. We hope to see you again next week. As as we start our next series. It's a return to what we've done in the school holidays last time uh, on this rock, some foundational texts uh, that individual preachers will be sharing a little bit on. Looking forward to seeing you at that. Until then, God bless. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I see many searching for answers far and wide, but I know well, they're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we
Oh 